Winter, 1980. I had tearfully boarded a bus to take me from Ontario to British Columbia. I was having a hard time in life and needed a change. I had saved $200 and with that bought a one-way ticket. When I got out there, my Aunt Sheila awaited me. She was such a kind soul. She helped me along and found me a great job that was just posted in the paper. So off I went again, up into the interior of British Columbia. A dream job, all right. I was soon working as a maid, housekeeper, in a beautiful British Columbia ski resort by the name of Mount Panorama. One of the perks of the jobs was a free mountain ski pass, so we got to ski for free on our day off. Unfortunately, one day while racing for fun, skiing with a member of our Canadian ski team, I hit a patch of ice that literally tore off the whole side of my atomic ski while turning. I ran over the do not enter sign and went pretty far down the mountain slope. I was tumbling and tumbling in what seemed like forever. Time was in slow motion. I remember hearing voices and people were digging me out. I was pretty much surface buried under lots of powder snow. Down the mountain I went in a toboggan stretcher to the hospital to the town of Invermere, British Columbia. I remember being more embarrassed than anything, but I could not move. I tore all the muscles in my right side. I was then off work for a week or two. While recovering one night, I had a dream. When I woke up, I remember telling my roommate Barbara about it. I had woken her up trying to change my sleeping clothes. I was soaking wet from sweat from the intensity of this dream where I was in the underground parking lot of the Mount Panorama Resort. In the dream, there was blood flying everywhere, and I was trying to fight off someone who was attacking me. There were just lots of close-ups of fists with blood all over them, bloody hands. I remembered an old van that was parked and then all I saw was the concrete floor and blood all over me. That was it. I warned all of my friends who shared our staff condo, be careful in this underground parking lot as I had an awful dream. I then told them all about what I had seen in the dream. That morning, I thought I would go and do some light duties. All the housekeeping staff would meet in a large room to get our jobs for the day. When I went in the staff meeting office, everyone was there. They all turned around and looked at me as I entered the room. I didn't realize the police were there to brief the staff on an incident and ask some questions. A hush came over the room. A strange type of eye contact was everywhere. People were whispering and looking at me. Then, my supervisor came up to me and asked me to come to another room right away. I was singled out. I thought she seemed really mad. I got the feeling that maybe they were going to fire me because of my injuries from my accident and I couldn't do regular duties. I was at a total loss as to what was going on. I remember my heart starting to pound. Then on the way, she turned and asked, So, are you a white or black witch? What? I asked. Then she commented, You better watch that kind of stuff, kiddo. Then looked at me with a smirk. I remember feeling very confused and stunned by her comment. I couldn't believe it. Two very large Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers arrived and then began to interrogate me in the little room. It seemed like hours as I went over my name, date of birth, why I was there, how long I was there, my past, my family. All of this was being written down. This went on and on, then finally they got to the point. So we were told you had a dream. I was totally shocked. After a few tears and the officers checking with my roommates, I felt they finally believed that I had nothing to do with the attempted murder in the underground parking lot that night that had left a woman in a coma. I thought I was losing my mind. From a dream to the RCMP interrogation, I was very frightened. They soon let me go after they were satisfied with my story. I was then allowed to go to work again after they were finished with me. I was in extreme pain that day and so stressed about that meeting. I remember I left work early to go home to rest. This had caused quite a stir on the mountain, you cannot imagine. I then had so many people who were waiting for me and many just showed up at the door to have a coffee and chat with me. Of course, I was asked about the dream and the RCMP stuff and if I could just hold their ring or necklace, if I could pick anything up. I had done stuff like this when I was six or seven, and here I was now, 21 years old, doing it again. The universe was saying, hello. On the downside, too, though, there were also the people who took an instant fear of me, and you know what fear does. The talk of, she's a witch, was also everywhere, it seemed. Days later, the RCMP came back to see me, as they had no leads. This was a very nice ski resort with some really big-name guests, like Lyle Wagner, and we had heard Jane Fonda was coming soon. Understandably, they wanted something to happen, I felt, and pretty soon. This didn't give good press to the place, I am sure. They wondered now if I could help them. 
As the one officer said, I really don't put too much into you psychics, but if you get anything, here is my card. I said I would try. Wow, I thought. It really hit me. An RCMP just called me a psychic. I contended to them, I'm not a psychic. The other officer just winked. I was raised by my mother to keep my mouth shut and knock it off when it came to this stuff. Don't talk about things other people don't understand, she would say, from when I was very young, but now it was a huge awakening to me. I didn't realize until much later that this was the universe saying, you have a gift, use it in the best of ways. The police asked me if I can go back to my dream, which I did right away, that was easy. I just laid down and relaxed and put myself almost to sleep. Then it just happened. I did see a face and it was my brother's. So I told the officers, I know my brother, which to me means she knows her attacker. Then again, going back to the dream once more, I was in a deep, deep meditative state. I asked to see the attacker's face. I did see a man's face, and three days later, I let the officers know I now had a description of a face I saw in this dream. I was to meet them in the nice little restaurant at the resort. A police sketch artist was coming to take my description, as there were no computers back then. Then I saw the face all right. He was right there in the restaurant. I remember him being subdued by two of the staff, and shortly, the RCMP were there. He just came in the restaurant and started with some really bizarre behavior. I believe he was drunk. I remember a phone on the wall he was trying to use and started to smash the receiver. This was the woman in the coma's ex-boyfriend who had been stalking her. I heard he worked in maintenance. I was quite relieved to know he had been arrested. End of story, or so I thought. A couple of weeks later, one of the officers came to me to let me know that this suspect had got bail and they could not guarantee my safety. So they asked me to leave British Columbia and go back home to Ontario. This was my dream job. I had so many friends, I didn't want to leave. I decided maybe it was best to go home. I did feel a great unease, and I think too the trauma of this brutal happening weighed heavily on me. So I lost my job, my dear friends, and went home, all because of a dream. The police are not ones to advertise that they use clairvoyance often for these kinds of cases, but it is more common than we think. I have since met my roommate Barbara again after 34 years, and she said, It feels like I've been catapulted back in time, like I'm there living it all over again. It's amazing how the memory can be so strong. I'm so happy to have found you again after all these years. You're amazing.